Today in at issue for teens, Philanthro Teens, remarkable stories of teen generosity. You could just take something you love and just put time in it and call it volunteering. It's amazing. It's awesome. You, you get something out of anything. That's that issue today. Welcome to that issue for teens. I'm Kevin O'Keefe. If you think you're too busy to volunteer or it's just something you do for a school credit, think again. The teenagers you're about to meet say volunteering has radically changed their life for the better. From HIV AIDS prevention to keeping kids out of gangs, there's lots of ways to get involved, make a difference and help. And in the end, you might find out that you're the one who's benefiting the most. Patrick Hickey has been talking with some remarkable teen philanthropists and joins me in the studio. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, what's unique about the teenagers you've been talking with? Well, from what I've found is that, you know, normally kids look up to adults and right. elders for inspiration. But with the four guests that I've found, it tends to go in the other direction. For instance, two of these, uh, young, a young man and a young woman, were yeah. born with physical disabilities, the sort of disabilities that would give any parent heartache, anguish, and from the rest of us would probably elicit pity. But not them. Hmm. Through sheer determination, they took what their so-called disability and turned it into a shining example of what all of us can be capable of. Uh, tell me about Jerry. Who's Jerry? Jerry is a, a young woman from North Bay who had a tragic coincidence happen to her when she was young. Um, an old friend died of AIDS, one mm. of the first young men to ever get AIDS in Canada. And so just before he died, he said, I wanted to have one thing happen. If anything could happen, I want zero cases of AIDS because right. AIDS is 100% preventable. So they started the Patrick for Life Foundation because his name was Patrick Fortin. And at 13 years of age, she became the youth ambassador. Wow. And she 13. went 13 years and up in northern Ontario talking wow. about sex and sexuality <laughs> and those things for a 13-year-old wasn't easy. Yeah. But she persevered and she's turned it into one heck of an organization. And I understand Amber is coming in as well. Who's Amber? Amber Amber is from what you'd call a mixed diversity neighborhood in, okay. in Toronto. <laughs> very like a socially conscious so, term. So where <laughs> there's a few pockets of wealthy homes and right. then a few, a lot of pockets of not so wealthy homes. That offsetting means that they just don't tend to get the attention they need in terms of resources and funding. So kids tend to go wayward Board kids, idle hands, devil's tool, you know what right. I mean? Gangs, yeah. So Amber said, forget it. She's going to start something herself. So her and a group of people all got together and started the South Etobicoke Youth Assembly, which provides recreational facilities, education seminars, bullying workshops, anything that kids need free of charge. Alex. Alex? Alex was a young man who was unfortunately born with no fingers on his right hand. But that didn't stop Alex from doing anything. Through the War Amps Chant program, he was able to learn that his amputee was hardly a disability, and he eventually became a counselor to other amputees to show them even further. But what's more important about Alex is it's not the amputee children that he counseled, it's their parents. By just showing them that, look at me, they can have just as nice a life as they will. And uh, Ramya, who's Ramya? Ramya was a, a young woman who was born with visual impairment. Mm. But you know what? From talking to Rami, she can see more things than I ever could. Because huh. not only does she volunteer with the CNIB to help other children with visual impairment, she, she puts it across the board. Sick Kids Hospital, um, the Pink Shirt Day movement, anti-bullying efforts. Rami does it all. And, and, and to, the, to the point that her uh, volunteer work was recognized, that she was the first visually impaired person to carry the Olympic torch in Canada. Excellent. Well, thank you for digging these people up. I look forward to meeting them. My pleasure. Well, Ramya is out to change the way we see blindness and visually impaired people, sort of like this ad from the CNIB. Check this out. Not everyone who looks blind is totally blind. Nine out of ten people we assist have some vision. CNIB. Vision health, vision hope. So, Ramya, I always said if you're checking someone out, you have to drop something, and then you pick it up and turn this way. That's the way to check someone out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's nothing discreet about you. You're very active. 17-year-old Ramya Amethan joins me in the studio. Welcome to the show. Thank you. 
You had told Patrick that you were quite shy growing up as a little girl. Why, why do you think were you shy? Um, I don't know. A lot just culture, I guess. I was uh, born in Sri Lanka and, you know, raised very traditionally, I guess, even though we moved to Canada. I was very young. But, um, yeah, I was very shy growing up. It took me a while, and it still takes me a while to, you know, come out of my shell. So, so in terms of your disability, can you tell me a bit about it? You're visually impaired? Yeah, I'm visually impaired. I have something called Lieber's congenital amaurosis. Uh, LCA for short, and I was born with it. It's a genetic condition, obviously, and um, it affects a lot of different parts of my vision. It's in the retina, and I have some color blindness, some night blindness. I have a nystagmus, which is a movement of my eye, and um, yeah, a couple of things. So I'm nearsighted, and yeah. So mm -hmm. what can you see right now? You can see me? Yeah, I can see you pretty well. <laughs> so you can't see color? Not very well. No. What was your parents' reaction when they found out that you had this disability? Um, it took them a while to grasp it, to kind of admit to themselves, okay, I have a daughter with a disability. Um, they, they looked around for a lot of help, a lot of uh, people who can tell them, you know, what they want to hear, like it can be cured, it's, uh, it's not as bad as it may seem, you know, there's a lot of research going on about it or whatever and you know like when they came to Canada they saw more opportunities more help so yeah the reaction was not very good at first but I'm, I'm sure they've come to accept it. So. Uh, you were teased growing up because of it? What did kids say? Yeah I mean um, I think like as a kid it's hard to grasp like the fact that somebody might be a little bit different than you so People, you know, growing up, little kids are like, oh, really? You have a problem with your eyes? That's weird, you know? It's just, I guess maybe I took it to heart, too, but, um, yeah, kids are kids. <laughs> and why do you think that there's this, I don't know, stigma attached to the idea that disabled people are somehow lesser people than able-bodied people? Um, I don't know. I guess it's just something, like, it's always, in the world, it's always harder for people to accept people who are different or anything, a situation that's different than what they have as perfection in their mind. But, um, you know... Like and you said that teaching people about your disability actually helped you sort of come out of your shell a bit more. Yeah, How did for that sure. Happen? Because it's, I find myself very comfortable to talk about my visual impairment. I don't feel awkward about it at all. So if people... Like when people want to know more and when they ask questions, you know, professionally, I don't mind. So that gives me a topic that I'm comfortable to talk about, so for sure. Now, you've done lots of volunteer work, mm -hmm. and not just with the CNIB, which is, I think, really interesting, but a whole slew of other things. I want to start with the CNIB. Mm -hmm. What do you do with the CNIB? Um, I just volunteered a couple of times at their March break camps that they hold for the kids there, their clients. And um, I've even participated in some of their summer camps, like their IRTC. And um, like later on, I'll be going to their um, university and college preparation programs and volunteering with them like that. A couple of different things, just helping out the staff and all. So that sort of in some ways connects the dots, makes sense, because you're visually impaired, mm -hmm. you want to get back to the CNIB, but you do yeah. so many other things <laughs> mm -hmm. that aren't related to your disability at all. Can you tell me about Interact? Interact is like my favorite. I'm the president of Interact at my school this year. Last year I was vice president and uh, basically we help other organizations. We fundraise for different causes, uh, do some local stuff like uh, wrapping uh, Christmas baskets for local families and then we do some international stuff like raising our world vision child. Her name is Amina and yeah we did a lot with Haiti and so much other things. Yeah. I dream Mm -hmm. and homelessness. What's iDream? Uh, iDream, it's a rising organization. It's a local organization. And um, we, I'm not really a part of that anymore, but it was very interesting and very inspiring. We went to downtown one time and we just talked to a bunch of people who are uh, suffering homelessness and we got to know how it is to walk in their shoes and basically hear about their experiences. It connected us to Toronto a lot. Pink Shirt Day. I know what Pink Shirt Day is because I wear a pink shirt on Pink Shirt Day. Yeah. You're wearing a pink shirt now. <laughs> right now. But you brought Pink Shirt Day to your school. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring that to your school? Because it's really good to see that teenagers want to inspire other teenagers and doing good. It's very, I love seeing that. And um, it wasn't really Even though me. you can't really see pink <laughs> Not well, but yeah. So tell me what is exactly Pink Shirt Day? Pink Shirt Day is um, basically um, one at one school in British Columbia, this guy, grade nine boy, went to school wearing a pink polo shirt on the first day and he got bullied for that. So um, some other teenagers in grade 12 realized that, hey, this is not good. So the next day they spread out like 50 pink shirts and made 
other people in school wear pink shirts to school, guys and girls. It was a sea of pink. That's what they called it, just to, you know, say stop bullying. Uh, sick Kids Hospital. Mm -hmm. How much time do you spend at Sick Kids Hospital every I, week? I spend all of August at Sick Kids, three <laughs> hours a day, three hours five a days day, a week. Yeah. Five days a week volunteering. Yeah, yeah with kids. Every day. Yeah. What I do you do kids. there? Um, I was a child life volunteer, so you know, you just distract kids from any kind of um, thoughts of surgery or you know, anticipating surgery and all that. It's it's awesome. I love kids. So these are kids who are about to go into surgery. Mm -hmm. Or come out them, of surgery. And you're with them when that yeah. happens. What do, what's that experience like for you? Why that experience, you it's amazing. Because, I don't know, the kids have this innocence, right? And when you're in that kind of an environment, they really inspire you. Like, I, I don't know, they don't do a lot. But I would, people would say that's a horrible environment, that you're no. with a child who's scared and alone and no, suffering. No, they're still kids. Kids are kids. They want to have fun. You know, if you don't talk about their surgery, they don't think about their surgeries. Really? So, yeah. Uh, the Olympic torch. I have to ask you about that. You actually carried <laughs> the Olympic torch as part of the Vancouver Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, first of all, how did that come about? Um, there was a contest on TV, the RBC contest, and they wanted, their theme was how to break down barriers in Canada. So our TDSB vision program, which I'm a part of, um, we decided to take some students and just create a portfolio about how we break down barriers in Canada by communicating about our visual impairments and saying, hey, you know, we're not just visually impaired, we're people too. So we created a portfolio and they liked it. And yeah, so we got to carry the torch, 20 of us. Tell me about that experience carrying the torch. It's amazing. I, I don't know how to describe it. Like, you have to do it yourself to understand how it feels, but it's like, I don't know, being in love or something. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> being in love for two seconds of your life. <laughs> uh, someone is watching right now and thinking, um, there's nothing I can do to volunteer. No one would be interested in me volunteering. Volunteering is boring. Oh, Here no. you are, someone who's visually impaired who has a great excuse not to volunteer, and yet you're like <laughs> doing six million different things. Yeah. What would you say to someone watching right now about why they should volunteer? Oh my gosh, why they should volunteer. First of all, there's so many different kinds of volunteering. It's not just as like one category. You could just take something you love and just put time in it and call it volunteering. It's amazing. It's awesome. You, you get something out of anything. So. Well, thank you very much for coming in today and thank sharing you your story. Me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, when we return, being born without fingers doesn't mean you can't lend a hand. Stick around.